All right. In this lecture, I want to talk about literate programming and get into the idea of how you use R Markdown documents to uh, kind of weave together your code and the text that you want to write about it. I want to start a little bit with the history of this, mostly just because I think it's so fascinating and it includes a very fascinating character in the history of computer science. So the basic idea of literate programming is that it allows you to put within the same document a mixture of the text that you want to write about something and then also code and not just code, but code that can be executed, that can be run and the results put out. Um, so this means that you can create files that are then rendered. And when it, it's rendered, it's sent to a programming language first, like R, and it's run by that software. And then it gets sent to a language that renders it out in a nice um, output format that you want to share with others. The final output will have both the, the results from running the code and then also any of that regular text that you put in. This idea springs some, from some ideas in literate programming from Donald Knuth. And um, he is one of the, the most interesting computer scientists, I think, and um, pretty, pretty acknowledged by lots of people as, as maybe the best computer programmer that has ever come along. Um, he's written a masterpiece, it's called The Art of Computer Programming, uh, that, that is, is very well known among computer scientists. But he also, he writes in such a way that is so meticulous in detail that he's long had this system where if anybody finds typos in his book and can send them in and nobody's found them yet, he will give them a check um, for $2.56, which he calls a, a hexa dollar, I believe. Uh, there's actually a whole a whole piece on this on Wikipedia that's a really fun read that talks about these reward checks. And I think he stopped doing the checks because there were some issues with, with maybe like bank security stuff, but he still does that idea. And so this is um, something that's kind of widely loved by the people who can find one of those and get one of those. But in any case, one of the ideas that he had was when we write up our code and write up our documentation, it's really important for us to do that for for humans. So the computer needs to read the code, but when we explain it, instead of just having code comments that somebody needs to go through and follow, what if we explained it following the order that human logic works? So he created this web system that lets you go through and you use it more for compiled languages. So it's places where you've actually got kind of um, a whole compact, discrete program that you're creating in one batch, rather than something interactive like we work with R a lot. But it allows you to actually put in all the explanation of what you were doing throughout that program. And it would write it out in a way where you can kind of follow it along. And it's almost like a choose your adventure book where you read through and you read one function and there's all this explanation. And if it's using a sub function, then it has like go to page such and such if you want to see exactly what we're doing here and exactly the algorithm we put in for this piece. So I think that that was just this really wonderful idea that if we want to write good, solid code, we need to make sure that we are communicating what we're doing in that code, both to the computer through the code, but then to ourselves and to other humans through the way that we document it. The Knitter package and these R Markdown documents, that very much springs from the spirit of that, even though some of the details are a little bit different and the way it works is a little bit different. Um, so the Knitter package can be used for this idea in R, and what you do is we'll start with a document called an RMD document, an R Markdown. These will all have an RMD extension, and I've pulled this graphic, by the way, from the R Markdown cheat sheet, which is a very helpful resource as you're learning this. You can write up all of your text, but then you can also put your code in these very special places that you kind of mark off so that the computer can identify those spaces. When you render, it'll do one, it'll do two passes of that document. The first pass, it will just look for those code areas, those code chunks, and it will send those to R. R will run them, and then we'll send back the output from that, and that ends up replacing where the code was in that report. Then the second time, the second pass it does through, it sends it to one of these engines that can render it into the final format, one of the ones that takes a markup language and transforms that into the format that, that is going to look nice for somebody. So I've got the steps that we do for doing that, but I'm going to move into our studio to show you how to do it. But you, you have this here if you want to kind of take notes as we go along. 
So I'm gonna go in, I'm working in the project that we created earlier. But the first thing you need to do is open a new R Markdown file. So in new, I actually did it from this little thing, but there's also a menu that does new. You can choose to open one of these documents. We'll leave it as HTML for right now. Later in the class, we'll talk some about how to make things into PDF, but you could try making it into Word at some point if you want to as well. So uh, we'll put in example of our markdown, maybe for our title. And then if you want, you can put in your name as the author. And then when we do OK, it will open a file for us. Now, this is something really clever that, that's set up in RStudio with these new files. Instead of just opening a blank file for you, because really, these are just saved as a special type of plain text file. It's, it's nothing super fancy in the format that's underneath it. But um, instead of just opening up a blank file for you, it will open up a template. It will open up an example one that you can then change and you can take out parts and replace it with your own stuff. But it gives you that chance to kind of like remember how all the pieces work. So um, once you do it, once you open it, you'll want to save this somewhere. I'll just do this as example or markdown. You'll see that you get that saved as an RMD. And then once we start rendering it, you'll see another file with the same name, but that's got the output format. So HTML, for example, if we're rendering to HTML or .doc, if we're rendering to Word. So inside this, this template document, we can actually just try to run and it should work. So we can do that first and then we'll go back and look at the pieces and how some of the pieces are going. So to run all of these, you go up to this knit. It's called knitting it to render it into the output. So we'll knit that and it'll take just a second and it should open up for you a file. So this is the rendered version of that template example file. Let's go back now and look at how some of that's working. So I think first we can look up here, we've got the title and, and the author's name and then the date. Those are all elements that go in a special top, uh, spot up here called the YAML. Um, this gets automatically put in when you specify the title, when you open the file and you specify your name. You could change it. So um, I don't know, we could do like maybe one example. You can certainly change this text. But be very careful about changing any of the kind of formatting up here. It, it follows very close rules in terms of having to have these different keywords and then a colon and where the line breaks are and some things like that. So I, I try not to mess with that too much when I'm teaching people how to do this. Later, it turns out you can put a bunch of stuff in there to really customize your, your output. But for right now, try to treat that part a little bit gingerly. Uh, you can see the dates in here, too. It used that based on my computer system, the system date. But if you ever need to, you can change that date. Or you could take this whole line out and just not have a date show. Then the other part is giving the instructions for what type of output to go to. So we specified that we wanted HTML output, so we're doing that. Once we get down here, let's look first at um, some of just the plain text and see how that's working. So we've got some text along here. You can see we've got paragraphs. We've got some of the special formatting. So here, these carrots are indicating a link. And then right here, we've got those double asterisks that are showing that that should show up in bold. So in the actual text itself, it's got those little markers that say how to format things. Uh, we've got some subsections here, like we've got one on R markdown, and we've got one on including plots. And then we've also got this formatting down here with the back ticks. That's going to make it look like computer code. So it's going to look, it's going to be in that kind of like typewriter type font that looks like you've written it in code. So let's render this again and take a look again at how those elements of just the markdown text itself are showing up. Not looking at the code that's running yet, but just looking at those parts of the text. All right, so if we knit it, we can see that the title changed because we made that change in the YAML. And then we can see those two sections that were marked off with the hashes. Here's the link that we have with those little carrots around it. There's the text in bold. And then let's see, down here, you can see what it looks like when you do those back ticks to make something look kind of like it's computer code if you want to type out a package name or a function name or something like that. All right, so those are the elements of the text itself. Next, let's look at the places where we're putting our code in. All right, so these are called code chunks, and they look kind of like this. 
these are places, they are all are gonna start with something that looks like that. So it's three back ticks and then in curly brackets, the letter R in lowercase. That's the indicator that you're starting an area where the computer should realize that it's code that it needs to send to R and then get the results back. Once you're done with the code, to close off that code chunk, you've got three back ticks all by themselves. So when it runs this, what will happen is when it sends parts of this to R, it'll go through everything. When it gets here, it will run summary cars. Now cars is a data set that automatically comes with R. We can come down to our console and you can see that this is the output that it gives. So when we run it, it should give that same output and it should, should place that into that spot in the document. Next, we have an example where it's showing a plot. Uh, for right now, let me take out all these extra pieces, but we can see again now that we're starting with those three bag ticks in the R, and then we've got some code, and then we've got the next part. Again, this is a data set that comes with R, so we can come down to the console and try running just that line, and we can see the plot that we'll get out there. All right, so let's just run this one more time and convince ourselves that that's really what's going on, that it's giving that output. So we can come up and see that in that first code chunk, we had the summary cars and it ran it and it gave it the same output that we'd see if we ran it at the, count, the console. But now let's put it right in our document. And then the same thing for this plot and pressure. Now there are a few things to know about these code chunks. The first is they do have this really, really long kind of like combination to set them off. So if you're typing it out, you're doing three back ticks and then a curly bracket and then an R and then a curly bracket and then you close it doing the three back ticks. That can take a while. So instead what you might wanna do is go up and there is insert and you can insert an R code chunk um, and that will put it in. You'll see here too, you actually can put in code chunks for a number of different languages. We won't really get into that, but if you do use Python as well, or if you use things from the command shell, the bash shell, uh, you can put all of that in, even SQL and some special things like that. But for right now, we'll only be doing R. There's also a keyboard shortcut for doing this. And so of course you can always go up to help and look for the keyboard shortcuts help. That will bring up the reminder for all of them on your computer. Those tend to be different on different types of operating systems. And so we can go through, and it's right here in the source editor, the insert chunk. So for my computer, it would be option, and then um, I believe command, and then I. And so that will allow you to quickly add these in. So again, anytime you wanna add in some code, you can come in here. So we could do, we could print out the numbers one to 10 right here if we wanted to. Or we could, let's see, we could load the Faraway package if that's the package you have installed and then do your World Cup data. And then we could do a summary of that. All right, so let's try knitting those pieces. All right, so you should be able to see now that those extra parts that we added, it again has the code and then it's printing out. And again, here it has the code and then it's printing out the results, just like if we had run it at the console, but now it's putting in the, this document where we can add in text and explanation and all of that as well. Now there are some other things you can add in for these code chunks. You can add some different options and you can also give them each names. So we might want to go through and name this one cars maybe. Maybe we want to name this one as um, low data. And maybe we want to name this one as one to 10. So you should use the same rules that you use for our object names in the names that you give to these chunks. You don't have to include names for any of them. You saw that everything was running fine without us having those. But these are nice because if you do have error in some of your code some places, these will help you find it. You'll get an error message when you run the whole thing that says like you had an error in the chunk that's named one to 10 or named load, load data. And that lets you quickly go back and diagnose it. Later, we'll look a little bit um, at being able to add in references to so saying like figure one um, and, and those use these names as well. So it's not a bad thing to get in the habit of, of creating these names. There's some other options too, and any of the other options you'll include starting with a comma 
after the name. If you don't have a name, you can just start these directly. So one of them is echo. The default is to echo all the code. That means to repeat it in the output document. But there might be some cases where you don't want to do that. So I'm going to delete some of this so we have a simpler document again. So right now, we don't have anything right here. And we do have this echo equals false right here. So when we run this, it won't print out this code anymore because we've changed to say that we don't want to echo that code. So now we can run through and we can see it's given us the output, but it didn't say the code that we ran. Where it's down here, where we didn't change that, it still shows the code and then it shows the output after. Another thing that you can do is you can set what are called global options. These will translate down to all of the other code chunks that you have, and it will serve as the default for all of those. So for example, we could come up here and we could change this default for echo to be false. Now for both of these code chunks, it will be false, so it won't print out the code chunk, and we can kind of confirm that. So you'll see now it doesn't put any of the code to start. This can be really nice because what you might want to do is while you're working on a report, have this set to true so all the code's printed out and you can check that. But then when you're ready to share it with somebody else who doesn't want to look at all the code, you can change it to false and then you can print out with just the output from that code. There are other things that you can do too, like you could, let me see, I'll change this one back to true. You could do eval equals false. In that case, it will not evaluate the code here. Oh, I lost a parenthesis when I did that. All right, so when we do this, it won't evaluate that code. It'll still print it out, but it won't actually run it, so we won't get any output from it. So we can take a look at what that looks like. So now you can see that it's still printed out that code if we wanted to show somebody an example of the code, but it hasn't run it and we don't have any output. One other note to say about these global options and code chunks, is that if you have something up here, but then you have something different set within one of your code chunks, the precedence is to do whatever's local. And if there's not anything specified locally, then to use the global option. So for example, if I leave this to echo equals true, and I come down to one of these code chunks, and I say echo equals false, then in the code chunk where I've specified locally what echo should be, it'll use this value, even though it's different from the global option. On the other hand, if there's one where I haven't specified that, it will use this default. So we can knit that and we see that the first for the first code check, it's printed out the code. It's done that echo equals true, which was the global option because I didn't set anything locally. And then down here, it used the, the, um, the local option of false to not print that out. All right, so going through these, these slides, it's really a lot of what I just talked about. The first thing is to remember that we've got these markers that set off first that we're at the start of some code that should be evaluated and sent to R, and then these three back ticks to indicate that we're done, that we've gotten to the end. Next, you'll start each of these with R, but then you have room for putting in a name for the chunk. Um, these names need to be unique across the document. You can't have the same name in two different chunks or you'll get an error. And then also, um, as a note, any of the chunks that you don't name, Knitter will actually number. So later it'll refer to it by number and error messages or things like that. So you can go back and kind of try to count through your code chunks to identify the error as well. But again, I think it is helpful to have names. Uh, these are just some notes. We, you don't have to name every chunk, but these are some of the advantages in terms of finding errors and then later being able to use them as a reference. We talked about code chunk options. We talked about echo and eval. There are a number of others. Some of the ones that I find myself using pretty frequently are messages and warnings, which you can set to true or false, depending on whether or not you want to print out messages and warnings. And then include, if that's false, it will run the code, but it will print out neither the code nor the results. It'll just run it. So you kind of have that in your session if you need it later. You can also specify how you want to print out the results. So all the earlier ones I was showing either take true or false. These are ones that take other values. So results specifies how you want to print that out. Do you want to hide the code or do you want to print the results? 
Uh, you can specify the, the dimensions of a figure with things like fig width and fig height. Again, all of these you'll kind of string just like you would arguments, the formal argument and then the value as you're doing a call in an R function. So you can put those values and then if you want to put more than one, you'll separate them with a comma. And that all happens inside those curly brackets, but after the R piece. Again, just a note that you can set global functions, but when you set those kind of like global global options, global preferences for the code chunks, if you have something different within the local code chunk, then the local will take precedence over the global. As one last note, we've talked about doing these code chunks, but you can also do our output directly in the text that you're writing, which is pretty cool. You'll mark those with a back tick and an R, and then the code you want to run, and then another back tick. And this is often something that you want to do kind of just like if you have small code you want to put in. So sometimes you might want to do it for the dimensions or something like that. So in this cars data set, maybe we want to know how many rows that has. If you were working at your console, you could do that by doing n rows of cars. Oh, sorry, that shouldn't have an S on it. So we can see that that's got 50 rows. Maybe we want to add in here that the cars data set has, and we want to say the number of rows. So we could print out 50, but if later this data set changed a little bit, we'd be wrong. Instead, we can pull it directly from the data. We're going to do this kind of R. So this is setting off and saying some code to run right in that line. And then we can put this call that we wanted to put. All right, so what will happen is R will evaluate this and replace this with 50 when it runs through. So let's try doing that. And you can see right here, it's gone through and it specified that and it ran it and replaced it with the value that we got when we checked at the console. So that's all I'm gonna talk about right now for our markdown, but I encourage, I strongly encourage you at this stage to take a break and play around with everything I was just showing because most people, once they go around and try this out a little bit, very quickly get the hang of it. And that will help you to kind of process the pieces that come in the next video lectures.